Well, we're very happy to welcome you to, to the study of the book of Revelation, which we have entitled The Revelation of Jesus Christ because it is about Jesus Christ and His ministry, what He has to say to you and to me today. And so in this particular series, we're, studying, we're covering Revelation 4 through 12. It's what we're taking a look at. And if you have been following us, as we have been taking the subject step by step, you know that we have just finished talking about the trumpets in the uh, eighth and ninth chapter of Revelation, but the trumpets continue on through the tenth and eleventh chapter. And so today we're taking a look at the tenth chapter in a subject that is entitled Time of the End. Time of the End. And so we'd like to welcome all of you that are here today and also those of you that are joining us by television or by radio or on the internet. We're very, very happy to welcome you and we hope that today's subject will help you understand uh, God's message particularly to you and I that are living today because it's very, very important that we know where we are, where we're headed, what's going on. And then our next presentation will be entitled The Two Witnesses, and we're going to be looking at Revelation, the 11th chapter. And in that 11th chapter are two witnesses. There's also a beast there, and it's ne necessary for you to, and I to understand what took place during that period of time. And that's what we're looking at in our next presentation on the two witnesses. But today... We're taking a look at the time of the end. I consider this to be a, an extremely important chapter because it talks about the coming of Jesus Christ. It's what it deals with, the coming of Jesus Christ and also the time factor that's involved in that. So we hope that as we pick up God's Word and go through it verse by verse that you'll understand it, you'll see where we are, and above all, dear friend, I'd invite you Prepare your heart for the coming of Jesus Christ. It's very, very vital. We've taken a look at some uh, very serious, serious subjects and what happens to uh, those that do not follow the Lord. And sometimes as we read that, people have some trepidation about their own lives and what's going on. But God is more than capable of taking care of you and of me. And we're happy to have uh, Jim and Pam Rhodes with us. And uh, Pam is going to sing a song that's entitled On Eagle's Wings. And this song gets its inspiration from Psalms 91, and it brings assurance and comfort to you and me. And so I know you'll be blessed as they share this song with you. But before they do, Chuck Algar is going to come, and he's going to read with you the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation. Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 10, and we're going to read that chapter. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open them to the book of Revelation chapter 10. Let's read together. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand up to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seven angels, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, 
Go and take the little book which is in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. For when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. May God add his blessing to his word tonight.
Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today, first Lord, to thank you. Thank you for sheltering us, holding us in the palm of your hand, to know, to have the assurance that we're safe and that you care and love each one of us. Bless us, Lord, as we study your word now. Pray that the Holy Spirit may give us insight, enlightenment. We ask, Lord, that our hearts may be soft, they may be tender, that the Holy Spirit can guide and direct and your word can be understood. Bless, guide, and direct as we study your word together this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. The seven trumpets in the eighth and ninth chapter of Revelation are judgments of God against those who do not, who do not have the seal of God. Makes that very clear. Says that it's judgments against those that do not have the seal of God. But you find that the Lord doesn't intend just to do that and not make His people aware of where they stand. And so, John here inserts or puts an interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpet and shows you what God has to say about His people and what He's expecting of them. He does the same thing with the seals, folks. Remember there, He has an interlude or an insert between the sixth and seventh seal where He talks about his people and where they stand as far as the 144,000 are concerned and so forth. So he does the same thing here with the trumpets. And that's basically what we're looking at today is this 10th chapter and what God is saying about his people and what he expects from them. In that chapter is what the Scripture says, a mighty angel. Now, this angel is the very same one as you find in the fifth chapter in verse 2, where it talks about a mighty angel or a strong angel. So, this angel has come to John, and he has certain things to tell him concerning his people. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. Uh, this description of these angels, uh, folks, is mighty. Uh, angels can be as strong as a winterly, wintry blast, but they can also be as gentle as a summer breeze. But these angels are mighty, and they have great, great power. He had a little book open in his hand, very, very important. He has a little book. It's what? Open. Actually, in the original, it would say he had a little scroll open in his hand. And since it's talking about a little scroll, it's probably part of the scroll that the lamb took out of the father's hand, that he, the lamb loosed the seven seals and so forth. So he has a little book or a little scroll in his hand, and it is open. And he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When it says his right foot is on the sea, his left foot is on the land, it represents that that message has a worldwide part that's to be proclaimed to every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. That's why he's standing on the land and the sea. Cried out. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. God simply takes angels and uses angels to represent a message that's to be given to the world. That's what this angel here in Revelation 10 is doing. He has a message that the whole world is to hear, and you're involved. Because it is speaking about your day, my day, 
you're involved. This message is to go to the whole world. Uh, same thing is in concerning the message of the three angels, Revelation 14. Each one of those had a particular message that the whole world was to hear, proclaim. Same thing with the, Revela with the angel in Revelation 18, where it says the earth was lightened with the glory of this angel. It meant that he had a message that the whole world was also to hear. So that's what God uses angels for, to represent messages that the whole world is to hear. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand to heaven. Here he is, standing on the earth and the sea. He now has his hand raised to heaven, and he's about to shout something, proclaim something, and swore by him who lives, what? Forever and ever, who created heaven and things that are in it, and the earth and things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Now, folks, we talked about the souls under the altar that cried for judgment, and they said, how long is this going to go on? We've talked about the trumpets, and we're wondering that we're there to try to get men to repent. But now, this angel is proclaiming, there shall be delay no longer. Now, that's the way the New King James Version reads. I prefer the Old King James here much better. And it says that time should be no longer. It means that time has run out. It's come to its end. Time shall be no longer. So this angel is proclaiming to the whole earth, time's run out. It's over. It's come to an end. He continues on. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be what? Finished. It says here that he's saying time shall be no longer, that the mystery of God is finished. You know, the Bible speaks of the uh, mystery of iniquity. It speaks of the mystery of godliness. Both of those things are mysteries. If you try to understand or reason or find an excuse for sin, there is none. You can't, if you can find an excuse for sin, it ceases to be sin. There, there just is none. So, uh, when you start talking about the mystery of iniquity, why? Why would Lucifer, created by God in heaven, holding the position next to Christ, above all the angelic host, and all those things, why he would turn upon his own creator? Now, there, you can't logically make that work. It's a mystery. Sin is a mystery and always will be. But so is godliness. You try to think out a rational reason why Jesus Christ would leave the sight of his Father, the adoration of all the angels, the joy of all God's created universe, and come down here to this earth to be abused by mankind who didn't appreciate him or care for him. You try to think of a rational reason for that. There is none. But when it talks about here, the mystery of God should be finished, the mystery of God is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ that's preached to mankind for salvation. That is the mystery of God. And what he's saying here is the gospel has come to an end. The time has run out for mankind, that the mystery of God has come to an end, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then a voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book or the scroll, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the earth. Now John is told, Go to the angel. Take this scroll from his hand. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Oh, John, okay, 
Here, take it and eat it. And when you do, it's going to be sweet in your mouth. It's going to be bitter in your stomach. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Something about this message, something about what is contained in that scroll, something about what that angel is proclaiming that was going to be sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. There's something about that, that message that would have that effect upon John, that it would be sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. Well, you find that there are books of the Bible that, how should I say, go together. And the books in the Bible that, as far as prophecy is concerned, that go together is the book of Daniel and Revelation. All the prophecies in the book of Daniel are repeated in the book of Revelation. In fact, I doubt very well, very much, that anyone could really understand the prophecies of Revelation if he didn't understand the prophecies of Daniel. They're, they're that close together. They're uh, like a hand in a glove. You have to put them together. You have to understand them. This little book, this little scroll that we're talking about here that was in the angel's hand, that little book is also mentioned in Daniel. We read about it in Daniel, the 12th chapter, in verse 4, and it says this. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and what? Seal the book until the time of the end. He said, now, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Well, this little book that Daniel has here is in the hand of the angel, but it's what? Is it closed or is it open? In the hand of the angel. It's open. The little book was opened in the hand of the angel. But Daniel sees it and it's sealed. He said, Daniel, seal it up unto the time of the end. Now, when you and I begin to talk about the time of the end, the Bible speaks of the time of the end. Uh, do you understand the difference between the time of the end and the end of time? Because those are both phrases used in the Bible. It talks about the time of the end and the end of time. Well, when I was a boy, uh, my father would go to town in September, usually would buy a turkey. And he would bring that turkey back home, and we had a large cage there, and he would put the turkey in that cage. And he would give me instructions about feeding it and watering it and making sure that it was well taken care of and, uh, and all. And that was my job. I was to look after that turkey. When my father put that turkey in that cage, that began the time of the end. Okay? That began the time of the end. Said, shut it up, seal it unto the time of the end. But when Thanksgiving Day rolled around, that was the end of time. Okay, so that's the difference between those two. Shut it up, seal it, unto the time of the end. Well, when you pick up your Bible and you begin to read about the time of the end, God is very explicit Explicit. Over and over, he will tell you exactly when that time the end began. And all you have to do is begin to study the prophecies like Daniel 7, 25, and it mentions the time of the end. Revelation 11, verse 2, will talk about the time of the end. Revelation 12, verse 6, will talk about the time of the end. Revelation 13, verse 5, will talk about the end. And all of those point to the time of 1798 as beginning the time of the end. So when he told Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book unto the time of the end, very, very clear when the time of the end begins in 1798. Up until 1798, 
people tried to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, but they just couldn't seem to break through. In fact, you can still go back and read the writings of some of those theologians and those Bible students, and you can see as they try to understand what it's talking about, but they just can't seem to get through and understand what it's talking about. But in the late 1700s, there was a Jewish boy. His name was Joseph Wolf. Uh, Joseph Wolf, as a boy, accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. As he got older, he went away to school, to the seminary, studied, became a minister, and had a great, great burden on his heart for the Jewish people. And so he went over to Palestine, and he began to preach to the Jewish people there. But while he was there, he also carried a burden to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation. And he was trying to understand him. And he had come to the eighth chapter of Daniel and trying to understand that prophecy, what it was talking about, like verse 14, and that said, Unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he was trying to get that in his mind and understand what it was about. And he be continued to read, and he moved over into the ninth chapter, and he came to that text in Daniel 9 where the angel told him a definite period of time. He told him that there would be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks unto the Messiah, the prince. But it also said that when the Jewish people were to go back, that would begin a time, a set time for it to start. And so he began to get his Bible and every history book he could find, and he began to study it, and he began to trace that prophecy, found out the decree of Artaxerxes was given in 457 B.C., and tracing it, it brought him to the date of 1843. And Joseph Wolf began to preach all across the Middle East that Jesus was coming in 1843 because, you see, they believed that text in Daniel 8, 14 that spoke of the cleansing of the sanctuary. They be believed that that meant the cleansing of this earth by fire. And therefore, they said, Jesus is coming back. And he began to preach that all across Palestine that Jesus was coming. At the same time, I mean, during the same period of time, there's a minister over in England by the name of Edward Irving. Edward Irving has been studying the very same prophecies. And as he has studied those prophecies, they too have carried him by step by step down to the date of 1843. And Edward Irving began to preach in England that Jesus was coming in 1843. He was joined, folks, by 500 other Episcopal ministers. And that swept across the British Isles like wildfire that Jesus was coming in 1843. Uh, you want to say this is coincidental? That it just happened? At the very same time, at the very same time, there's a Roman Catholic priest in South America by the name of Manuel de Lacunza that is preaching the very same prophecies and they too as he has studied him it brought him to 1843 he's written a book called the coming king it has circulated all across South America and literally thousands of people have accepted and believed that Jesus is coming in 1843 it just happened at the same time there's a Baptist minister here in the United States by the name of William Miller who has been studying these prophecies now for nine years. And as he has studied those prophecies, he too has come under the same conviction that Jesus Christ is coming back in 1843. Begin to preach it around his church, the area where he was, and he was invited to preach at a congregational church up in Boston. He took his charts and everything, went up there and preached a series at that church about these prophecies. And when he finished, the young pastor of that church 
by the name of Joshua V. Heim stood up and said, Mr. Miller, do you believe what you're preaching? And William Miller said, I wouldn't be preaching if I didn't believe it. And then he said, well, why don't you do something about it? And under the guidance and help of that young preacher, they began to make one large city after another across this country. They would go in and pitch tents, folks, that would seat five, six, seven thousand people. And the people would come out, and so many would come out that the railroad companies would have to run tracks out to the tent just to take care of the people that came by rail car. And that, those places would be packed with thousands of people as William Miller preached night after night about the coming of the Lord. A young Methodist minister by the name of S.S. S. Snow went to hear William Miller. And he heard William Miller preach it and left that tent under great conviction. Went back home and got his Bible and got every history book he could get and he began to search it out and he found out that that decree of Artaxerxes was given in the fall of the year. And so as he began to trace it step by step, it brought him not to 1843, but it brought him to the, eight, to the fall of 1844. And he went to see William Miller, and they sat down, and they studied that together, and William Miller could see that he was right. And they called a Bible conference. People came in from all over the United States. In fact, some people even came from Europe. And S.S. S. Snow went up, went, stood up there and presented that paper. And when he was through, that Bible conference voted that Jesus Christ was coming back on October the 22nd, 1844. They voted that that became known as the midnight cry. They said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. They went out and they talked to everybody they could find. They told him Jesus Christ was coming back. They got on their knees. They confessed their sins. They got their hearts right for the coming of the Lord. They looked for it. They longed for it. It was in their mouths as sweet as honey. Time should be no longer that the mystery of God was finished. October the 22nd. 1844 came, and they went out to meet him. Some of them stood out in the yard. Some stood in vacant fields. Some sat in their house like William Miller, and they waited for the Lord to come. All day long they waited until the sun began to set that evening. And they encouraged one another, and they said, he'll come at midnight. And on into the night, they waited until the sun rose the next morning. And that which had been as sweet as honey in their mouths became bitter in their stomachs. They longed for it. They hoped for it. They believed it. Now, let me tell you something. If you take this prophecy in Daniel 9 and you trace it, it'll take you to 1844 every time if you're intellectually honest. They were wrong about what was to happen. It was talking about Christ coming to his Father in the sanctuary and for the judgment to begin. They were wrong in the application, but the Scripture had foretold that they would be wrong, had said that it would be a bitter experience for them, but out of that was to grow a movement of God's people. Did you hear me? Amen. Out of that was to grow a movement of God's people that had a specific purpose and plan and a commission to fulfill up to the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's where you and I stand today. I read to you all the verses in the 10th chapter of Revelation except the last one. Verse 11 says, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy, what? Again, before many people, nation, tongues, and kings. Thou must prophesy again. Prophesy again about what? 
about the coming of Jesus Christ. When it uses that word thou there, who's it talking about? Now, it's talking about you. You have a responsibility. You have been called. You have been chosen. You have a responsibility to proclaim that Jesus Christ is coming back. That is your calling. That is what you're to do. That should become the foremost thing in your life to tell others about Jesus Christ. Well, I know when you talk about the coming of Jesus Christ, well, people get excited and they'll say, oh, we don't know when Jesus is coming. Why, it could be a thousand years from now. We, we don't know when that will take place. In fact, I hear some dear saints say, oh, he's going to come as a thief in the night. So we don't know when he's going to come. Well, let me tell you something. If Jesus Christ comes as a thief in the night to you, you're lost. At least that's what the Scripture says. Listen. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And some people say, see... Right there, it says he's coming as a thief at night. The problem is most people quit reading right there. If you'll just read on, it makes it very clear. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, but you, brethren, who's that talking to? Okay, but to you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief, you're not in darkness. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We're not of night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Yes. If I know a thief's coming to my house, you better believe I'm going to be watching and waiting. Yes. And you and I ought to be also. So how can I know? How can I know that Christ is coming? How, how can I know that is taking place? Well, the Scripture gives us some insights. So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to what? Heed as a what? A light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rise in your heart. He said, You've got the prophetic word. You've got the prophecies. And he says those prophecies are clear enough that you shall not be in darkness, but that you have light and you should walk in the light of the word. How can you and I, who know what the book says and we know what God's word says, how can you stand there and not open your mouth and tell somebody Jesus Christ is coming? How can we do that? We are children of light, not of darkness. Therefore, you and I have a responsibility laid upon us to tell men and women Jesus Christ is coming back. For you once were darkness. You ever been there? For you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. The light should have dawned upon you. You should have woke up. You should see the day, not the darkness. Walk as children of light. And that's how we're to be in preparing for the coming of Jesus. I'm going to share a few things with you that I believe are clear indications of the coming of Jesus Christ. Where you and I are today and I hope that it will help you to prepare your heart. And if you're slumbering and sleeping, I hope you'll wake up. Amen. The first is the loss of liberty. The Bible clearly says 
that in the last days, one of the signs of Christ's return is the loss of liberty. You can look for that. You can expect it. It says this, He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. There are certain things that have happened that should tell you and I that things have changed. There has been a marked change in the way we live and operate in this country. I want you to listen. This is a statement by Michael Conley. He's an attorney. He's an instructor, a teacher of constitutional law in Carrollton, Texas. I want you to listen to what he has to say because it's vital to what we're talking about. In fact, I have concluded that this legislation, now he's talking about the health care bill, okay? And he wrote this before it was passed. We're now talking about the health care bill that has passed, okay? That this legislation really has no intention of providing affordable health care choices. Instead, it is a convenient cover for the most massive transfer of power to the executive branch of government and has, that has ever occurred or has ever been comprehended. He said, now what this bill is actually doing, and if you read the bill, it is transferring the power from that of the legislative branch of our government to the executive branch of our government. If this law or a similar one is adopted, and it was adopted, major portions of the Constitution of the United States will effectively have been destroyed. I think we have a statement in the writings of Ellen G. White where she says the principles of the Constitution will be done away with. The first thing to go will be the masterfully crafted balance of power between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the United States government. You can also forget about the right to privacy. That will have been legislated into oblivion regardless of what the Third and Fourth Amendment may provide, which it has. If you decide not to have health care insurance, if you decide you don't want it, there will be a tax imposed upon you, which is true. It is called a tax instead of a fine because of the intent to avoid application of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. They can call it a tax, get by with it. Dear friend, I don't know whether you're aware of it, but your liberty has greatly been curtailed. And there are steps that are being taken, and you and I need to understand what's happening. Secondly, financial bankruptcy. Uh, we never thought this day would ever come when as the country of the United States of America that has been the leader in so many things, today finds itself financially bankrupt. The Scripture prophesies that that would happen at the end of time. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, as many as trade on the sea, stood at a dense distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of the burning, saying, what is like the great city? Talking about Babylon, and we'll talk more about Babylon in future nights. But it talked about how it would crumble and it would be financially bankrupt. Where do we stand today financially? Well, we owe China $891.8 billion. 
we owe Japan $766. billion. We're in debt to those two countries that much. What does our national debt look like? As of July 9, 2010, we owed $13 trillion, $189 billion, $193 million, $996,874.56. Now, do you understand, folks, that the only asset the only asset the United States government has, do you know what the only asset they have is? The only asset they have is you. That's the only asset they have. You're the one that makes the money. You're the one that does this. You're the only asset they have. That simply means if we got a national debt like that, that every one of you and your children included are in hock for $42,000. Every one of you. And so, what's happening? What's going on? Very quickly, you know, I don't know if you can see this. Folks, in 2008, in 2008, our national debt, which was high enough at that point, was $5.6 trillion. 2008. Two years, it has risen to 13 trillion. You and I face some real problems. When I'm talking about financially bankrupt, we are. Total revenue. The total revenue, and that means all the money that you and I pour in the government to, through taxes and all that kind of stuff, the total revenue that they got was $14.8 trillion. In 2009, they spent $24 trillion, $700. When you take a look at all of it, that means that they went into the debt to a total of $9.9 .9 trillion. I, I don't know about you, but there's no way on earth to continue that kind of spending, spending and survive. You can't do it. So you and I need to understand where we stand financially. Morally corrupt. As a nation, we have become morally corrupt. Likewise, as it also in the days of Lot. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. They were morally corrupt. They were destroyed. So it will be in the day that God comes back. Paul talked about it, and he said, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgments of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Exactly where we are today. Where are we? Look, this, this is our situation today, folks. There's a murder in this country every 30 minutes. I'm not talking about killed. I'm talking about murdered. Every 30 minutes, someone is murdered. A woman is raped in this country every two minutes. Morally corrupt. Burglary every 15 seconds. 
There's a burglary that takes place. Theft, theft every five seconds. And I'm not talking about things, little things. When I'm talking about theft, I'm talking about major things. Every five seconds. We have become a nation that has no morals. A nation that even nations that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ look upon us as satanic because we've lost our concept of morals. One other point I'd like to mention. And I'll just say this. It bothers me greatly. I would never invite somebody into my home, folks, that would use profanity all the time and would teach my children that it was all right to lie and to kill and to steal. I would never permit that. But yet we all invite someone into our home, and they sit there in the corner of our house, and they use profanity, and they teach lying and stealing and killing, and we seem to think that's all right. I think we need to stop and take a good look of how we control that TV set. Amen. The earth shaken apart. Listen to this. Men's hearts fail them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Have you ever heard, I had never heard, of tornadoes? I grew up in part of the world that has tornadoes. I've seen them all my life. I've never heard of tornadoes that were a mile and a half wide and a hundred miles in length. But that's what we've had this year. Went right across Alabama and Georgia in that way. We have today storms like we have never seen. Floods. You, almost constantly, there's some place that's being flooded. This is pictures of Nashville. It's where I live, not far from there. You can see, this is Opera Land. This was the worst disaster that they've ever had since the Civil War. They still, you can't go to some of these places, they're still trying to rebuild it. Because we've had such terrible floods. Earthquakes. We have had 99 earthquakes, six point or greater, since the first of the year, this year. To say nothing of China, Spain, Solomon Islands, Indonesia, Baja, Mexico, Chile, and Haiti. Chile, that quake raked as one of the ten strongest earthquakes ever recorded. China, 6.9. Haiti, 7 point. Folks, when I say we had 99 earthquakes, that's since the first of the year to now. Last year we had 28, 6 point or greater. Uh, 19, excuse me, 2004 was the worst year for earthquakes in 500 years. Uh, 276,000 people lost their lives. We had one earthquake this year that took that many. You can look at their dead bodies strewn across the streets of Haiti where they died literally by the thousands. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. I hope. I hope by the grace of God that you understand where we are, that you and I will prepare our hearts and look for the coming of Jesus Christ. Dear friend, don't let that friend, that neighbor, that loved one of yours go into eternity without salvation, or at least without it being offered to them. God bless you. Have a great day. Every day, thousands risk their lives to protect and serve their fellow men. They have a deep commitment to excellency and teamwork. And when others run from danger, they run to it. 
even if it means personal sacrifice, even if it means making the supreme sacrifice for another. They're always on call, ready to serve, no matter what. Friends, you and I can learn a lot from firefighters. In the United States, the majority of them are volunteers. That's right, volunteers. But even for those who are paid, it's more than a job, it's a calling. Jesus said in John 15, verses 12 and 13, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Those who follow the words of Jesus are his friends. But Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing thought. Christ laid down his life for us, even though we were not his friends. A firefighter is willing to do the same. He's constantly preparing for his next mission because his own life and the life of others depends on his training and qualifications. My friends, that's what we're doing right now with this series. We are preparing you for what is to come. Our goal is to make you skilled in the Word so that by the power of God you can bring others to safety, the safety that can be found only in the arms of a loving Savior. Won't you help us to train and prepare others to fulfill this mission? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the second series, Revelations from God's Throne Room, may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series, including Worthy is the Lamb, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, The 144,000, The Seven Trumpets, The Time of the End, The Two Witnesses, and War in Heaven may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.